qualified as a chartered life underwriter and a chartered financial consultant and is currently a claim team manager for State Farm Insurance. Mr. Neville earned a BA from California State University in Long Beach in 1987. With over 20 years of experience at State Farm, including 10 years in human resources, Mr. Neville has gained an insightful perspective about corporate culture, the, inter the human connection, and the interview process. Now that's his bio, but I am up here today to give him my own personal testimony and my gratitude. In late December, I applied to Princeton Theological Seminary. I received an email back a week later asking to set up an interview. On January 23rd, I flew out to Princeton uh, to do this interview and meet with the admissions committee. On February 5th, I received a special email from Princeton saying not only was I accepted, but they were offering me a full ride for all three years to attend there. When I found out, I immediately told Dr. McClatchy that Mark Neville is a genius. I knew exactly what to do from the moment the interview was scheduled to the moment I received that acceptance letter. I knew what to say from the moment I shook the admissions committee's hand to the moment I wrote them all individual special thank you notes. During the interview, I have five stories that Mr. Neville will talk about today. Five stories that came straight from my heart and mind that I knew could be the answer to any and every question that this admissions committee could have for me. Uh, in fact, I was so prepared for this interview that it didn't even feel like an interview. After a while, it became more of a conversation. It was relaxed, easygoing, and it was natural. I can only say is that pay attention to what Mr. Neville has to say today, because what he has to say is invaluable. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce to you all Mr. Mark Neville.
kids that will turn around completely uh, here in the next few years. So I want you to picture, if you've ever been to a job fair, uh, most companies have booths uh, set up and you can visit the booths in which, for organizations, companies in which you're interested. And I, I was no different and at, the, at the time. We had a table and I would have a, this special tablecloth and have our company logo on the front uh, of it. And I can specifically remember one job fair in the Los Angeles area where on this side of my booth was Google. I, no one really knew what Google was uh, at the time. It was, it was relatively an upstart. But um, during this dot-com boom, a lot of different benefits were being offered by these very progressive companies, Google being one of them, and they had dogs with them. Because in Google, you can bring dogs to work. And that was a great attractor to, to you know, bring people, uh, candidates, to their, to their booth. On this side, I mean, my left side, was the FBI. So I'm sandwiched, being an insurance guy, between two sexy companies. And honestly, it was difficult to even get anyone to approach my booth. I mean, I had jobs. I had professional level jobs. But because of the, the time and because there were so many different companies hiring and offering different you know, signing bonuses and bring your dogs to work, carry a gun, and have a neat badge, I didn't have a lot to, to offer. It's hard to believe today because today I have a booth and I'll get a lot of great candidates because of the, the economy. I also realize, and I think it's, it's safe to say, that when people are, are growing up and they have aspirations of where am I going to be when I grow up, they, you know, when you're a kid, you dress up, you might be a fireman or a policeman or a nurse or uh, something. Very few people, as a matter of fact, if you did, I'd, I'd kind of be concerned about you, dress up as the insurance guy, right? Oh, if I could only be in insurance when I grow up. But uh, it just doesn't happen. And I realize that. It's, it's not the most glamorous of fields. Now, once you're in it, I you think you can weave your way and find some, some niche spots. I tell you that story because I want you to know, um, because of the, the last handful of years, as a matter of fact, probably ever since you started your college education, the economy's, economy's been tough. And I, I see article after article, is college worth it? These kind of things. And I imagine at some point you've had your doubts yourself. Is, is this going to pay off? Or is this a good, a good opportunity? Is this something I should pursue? Or should I just start making money today? Um, it will change. The economy will change. And that degree that I want you to have will be, as I said earlier, the best investment you've ever made, both time and money. So congratulations on that. All right, so, again, I want to give you perspective that you may have never thought about before. I'm not going to stand up here and give you things that I think you've probably heard in the past. <coughs> things like what to wear to an interview. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Matter of fact, I'm not really good with colors and you know, things like that, so uh, I, I, would, I would be out of my league anyway. But I'm not going to spend time with that. I'm not going to spend time with things like don't chew gum, don't use profanity. I'm not going to spend time. I'm really going to spend time on things that I don't think you've ever thought about before uh, or have never been uh, educated on. With the intent that at the end of this presentation, my goal here is to allow you to interview better because of your different perspective that you're going to hold. That's, that's the intent. All right. Being in, in human resources, and I was in there for a little over a decade, get the opportunity to interview and interview a lot. And I did. Thousands of, of candidates. And I've got some bizarre stories, and I'll share some with you uh, over that time period. But after about seven years of human resources, I was given an opportunity to meet with uh, a self-improvement coach. I have an odd title. And his name is Dr. Sam Smiley. He lives in Arizona. And the reason my organization sent me down to meet with him is we, as being our organization, was spending a significant amount of money utilizing Dr. Smiley's services. And we used them to prep some of our executives, up and coming execs, for that next level interview. 
and we do it repeatedly, as well as a lot of other large organizations would use Dr. Smiley. And they ask me, Mark, will you go down and meet with him and capture the essence of his, his, his program so that we can just use you internally to prep our, prep our individuals for the next levels and, and for interviews? Sure, absolutely. But I will concede that my, in my mind I was like, I'll go, but no one's going to tell me how to interview. I've done it thousands of times. I was a bit cavalier, maybe cocky on it. Agreed to go. So I, I, I told you it's in Arizona. So I flew down to Arizona. And I remember checking into the hotel. And he had asked me, Mark, will you call me once you're in the hotel? Um, and it was maybe at 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. And so as I'm checking in, I'm calling Dr. Smiley. Well, kind of funny, that's his name. But, and I tell him, I, but Dr. Smiley, I'm in town, just want you to know I'm checking in my hotel with the full intent of we'll meet tomorrow to start you know, this training series. Well, he, to my surprise, said, well, why don't we meet for dinner? And you know, I wasn't opposed to it. So I said, okay, he gave me directions to a, to a restaurant. And uh, it was a nice restaurant. A very, I'm too cheap to normally go to a restaurant because, I mean, this is a nice restaurant. So I really didn't know what Dr. Smiley looked like. I certainly seen his CV, a very fancy resume, very impressed uh, with what I saw on here. But I, I had not met Dr. Smiley myself, nor had I seen a picture of him. Just talked to him on the phone and saw his CV. So I'm waiting in the lobby of this, this nice restaurant, and this older gentleman approaches. And when I mean older, I mean older. I, uh, 100 might be a little strong, but, but an older gentleman. And he introduces himself to Dr. Smiley, and I was surprised. I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting that. Uh, and we sit down, and we have a nice little table for two, and I'm having a beer, and he's having wine. And I must say, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. He's just high energy, and he's smiling, and he's engaging. Uh, and about halfway through dinner, he stops me and says, Mark, what's, what's our waitress's name? I can see why. I don't know. And he says, well, I want you to watch this. And as the waitress approaches again, he says to the waitress, looks at her in the, in the eyes and says, Sarah, could I trouble you for some water? That was it, right? And she says, absolutely. And turns and goes to get some, some water for her table. Dr. Smiley says to me, what do you see? Well, you know, I had a lot of human resource experience, and so I told him, well, I saw you, Dr. Smiley, use her name. And he didn't know her. She had a Sarah name tag on her, crying out loud. I saw you look at her with good eye contact, and I saw you use a nice tone. And he says, yes, that's exactly right. Says, but now I want you to watch the rest of the night. So sure enough, you know, when Sarah would come and check on our table, She'd ask, is everything okay? Is there anything I can get you? But she'd direct all of this to Dr. Smiley. It was like I, I wasn't there. And now, Sarah's not hitting on Dr. Smiley because he's 100 years old. That's not what was going on. Dr. Smiley says to me, the reason she's doing that is she has a human connection with me now. That's, a, that's one of his terms, a human connection. And he's right. She did have a human connection, and he created it <coughs> simply by that warm tone, good eye contact, using her name. It was very interesting to watch, and we're going to talk about this human connection over the next hour here. A human connection. It's a term I do not want you to forget. Well, the evening ended, uh, and I, I must confess, I really did enjoy it. I enjoyed the heck out of him. Really a great guy, fascinating, as I said, energetic, entertaining. Yeah, it, 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 the time just flew. And as we're getting ready to park, he says, Mark, I want you to come to my house tomorrow morning at 7. And we'll start our interview prep. Now, so I, I get up. I'm not a morning person. I get there at, at 7, and I live in this beautiful area. Matter of fact, the, the driveway was like a mile long to get up there. And I, I get into, um, ring the doorbell, and he opens
opens up his front door. And right inside, I could see he had a little table set up with two chairs. And I knew that he was going to put me through a mock interview. Now, it's interesting because although I've interviewed thousands, it's much easier on the HR side of the table than it is being interviewed. I want you to know that because very few people like being interviewed. Very few people enjoy that process. And I was no different. And I came prepared. I had a stack of paper with me because I felt relatively confident that he was going to ask me questions about our profit and loss and different lines that we might have, how many agents we had, different delivery methods. I had prepped myself for virtually any question that I could forecast that Dr. Smiley was going to ask me during this. And right off the bat, he saw my stack as I laid it on the, on the table, and he asked me, what is that? And I told him, well, that's my, that's my prep. And he's extremely theatrical. And he took my stack, and he literally threw it into his living room. I mean, that's just weird for me. I, I was like, uh, really? And he said something to me that I want you to know. You have to remember this. He said, Mark, you would not have this interview if we didn't, we being a, a potential panel, already know you had the qualifications to do the job. That's not what this interview is about. It's really an important piece, because he's right. You would not have this interview if your ability to do the job because of your credentials was in question. Now, it's about, and people at my organization cringe at this, because it's so counter to our culture. It's about, do I like you? Will you be a good fit? Do I like you? Will you be a good fit? That's really what this process is about. And I, I was seven years into my human resource career when I was getting this information, and I would be the first to confess I was reluctant to buying into it. I was reluctant to buying into that, that it was really about this high L factor, this high likability. Certainly it can't be. It has to be about your ability to answer these questions with depth. Beating out that next candidate because of your incredible answers. It has to be about that, was my, was my perception. Even at that far in my career, that's how I felt. He disrupted that, that thought. So then, after, right after he threw my papers, he said, OK, Mark. Let's go ahead and start the interview. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Very common question. Very <coughs> procedural way to start an interview. And I did. I, I went something like this. Well, I'm Mark Neville. I've been with the company for blah, blah, blah. I have held a number of positions. And as I'm going through that process, I told you he's very theatrical. He starts looking under looking under the, the table. And, and it was just odd. I, I didn't know how to react. What do you do with the person who's interviewing? He starts acting that way. And I was just, again, I just kind of dumbfounded. And then he pops up, and he says, I don't like you. Wow. Yeah. I don't like you, he repeated. Um, and then he asked me, count to 10, using that same voice, that you started this interview with. And I said, OK. One, two, three. He's like, do you hear that? What is that, he said to me. Is that the mark, business mark? Is that the business mark? Because I don't like him. Mark of last night, when we had dinner, would have hired you for anything. Would have hired you for anything. This mark, I don't like. I'm not going to touch you. Yeah, I'm kind 
kind of reeling uh, with all this information. And it was tough to digest. It, it just was. Then he asked me, during our little introduction here, did you hear this voice? He calls it a self-reflective voice. You'll know what it is. If you've interviewed, you've probably heard it. It's this voice, kind of sits on your shoulder and says, oh no, what, what's he doing? Like, this isn't going good. Why, why am I going to this story? Oh, this is stupid. Right? I mean, you hear this voice in your head because your, your mind is so much faster than your mouth. And he asked me, did you hear that little voice? And I was like, oh yeah. Especially if you're looking under the table, right? I'm like, what the hell is he doing? He said, he said to me, last night during dinner, did you hear that self-reflective voice? And I said, no, I didn't. Did you enjoy last night? Yes. Yes, absolutely did. Loved it. Really did enjoy it. He's like, yes, that's right. Because last night, we had a human connection. If you have a human connection, you don't have the self-reflective voice. If you have the self-reflective voice, conversely, you don't have the human connection. And he's right. He's right. And then, he gave me some stats that I hadn't heard before. He said 80% of the information that, that, that he's receiving, or a panel interview, is receiving from the candidate 80% nonverbal. 80% nonverbal. That's the information that's being received. And this doesn't have to be a specifically trained HR person. 80% of the information that's being received, nonverbal. Then he went on to say, of that 80, 60% of that, the majority, tone <coughs> of your voice. The tone of your voice. That's why he made you go through that exercise. And he's right. I used this whole different persona. I sat erect and, and I used this. It was completely different. It wasn't conversational at all. It was this act that I felt needed to be put on to present this business persona, this consummate professional. But what's happening is that the tone of my voice wasn't allowing this human connection. And now he knew very clearly that I was reluctant, because I would come back in with the 80% and the 60%, and, and he knew uh, that I had significant experience and that I, was, I wasn't buying in to all this. He, he, he completely understood it, and he knew I didn't buy into what he was selling. And he had asked me, when I go back to work and I'm on panels, and I was on countless panels, he said, I want you to just be quiet, Mark. When the candidate leaves, just be quiet and listen to what your other panel members say. So I did. I went back to work and panel after panel, I was very cognizant, very aware to just keep my mouth shut and listen to what my other panel members would say. And what I hear is, oh, I really like her. She'll be a great fit. And when I first started hearing this, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, how did I miss it? How, how did I miss that this is really what's happening? Because I did. Then I had a very specific interview, and it was with an executive panel and myself. Generally, HR is on the panel when um, we're hiring a very, uh, for a very large, powerful position. And I, I recall this one because it, was, it, it illustrated what I'm trying to get across so well. We had one position. We interviewed five candidates, about the right ratio. And four of the candidates came from our corporate office, which was in, is in Bloomington, Illinois. And when you're in the corporate office, the main headquarters, you do get a lot of benefits from an experience standpoint. You can really get onto projects that impact our enterprise entirely versus being
being out in a regional area, you may impact a handful of states versus all 50. So these first candidates came and we interviewed them. And if you read what they said, and if you just read a transcript of the interview, you would be blown away because the depth of their answers were just outrageous. They had such great experience. I was able to save the company X number of million dollars by implementing a project in which efficiencies were blah, blah, you know, they went on and on. Just like that, with that marked business voice. And their answers were phenomenal. And then, we had a candidate who came in, and I still remember, she, the door opened up, and she comes in and she's like, oh my gosh, it, it probably looks like I slept in my clothes. Because I did, I missed my plane, and she went on, and it was, was not this fake persona, it was just real. And sat down, and smiled, and was conversational, was the absolute polar opposite of these other candidates. Her answers were not nearly as in-depth, were not nearly as significant, but remember, it's not about, can she do the job? We already made that decision. When we interviewed her, we'd already known she has the qualifications to do the job. So that's quite literally off the table. This is about, do I like you? Will you be a good fit? And guess what? I bit my tongue, deferred to the executives to hear what they'd say. I know it's not a stretch for you to understand. They said, ah. I like her. Her people are going to love her. I was, again, just blown away that that's exactly what's going on here. That's what this is about. Absolutely what this is about. Her answers were nowhere near what the others were. But she was likable. She was approachable. She did create a human connection. She smiled. Imagine that. What I didn't tell you is Dr. Smiley is also a painter. And while I was in his house, he'd walk me around and he'd cover up some paintings. For example, and all I'd see is the, the female's eyes. And I, before that training, I was really a fan of the eyes, the window to the soul. And he'd cover up everything but the eyes and he'd say, Mark, what's, what's this person thinking? And I'd look at the painting, the eyes that I could see, and I'd explain, well, Dr. Smiley, she looks, I don't know, kind of melancholic. Maybe like she broke up with her boyfriend. And he's like, yes, how can you tell? And I'd explain, well, the eyes, you know, you can feel kind of a sadness. And he's like, oh, good, good. And it would move on to the next painting. And it'd cover up everything but the mouth. And he'd ask the same question. And and of course, I was able to answer. And through that exercise, his intent was the mouth is the most revealing part. It's the most, it, it's the, the part of your face that provides the most information. It also drives the rest of the face. In other words, if you're smiling, your eyes kind of go with it. <coughs> it just makes sense. The point being, smile. Enjoy that interview process. Smile. I can't tell you how many interviews I've gone through. And they, the candidate leaves, and I wonder to myself, I wonder if they had teeth. I wonder if they had teeth. Because there was no smile there at all. So no smile. It's very hard to portray passion and enthusiasm for a position unless you're smiling. Wouldn't you agree with that? Now, I told you I've interviewed thousands. I have never written this. Overly passionate and enthusiastic for position. Now, I've never written it. I have conversely written, lacked passion and enthusiasm with great frequency. Matter of fact, it's one of the most common pieces of interview feedback. Lacked passion and enthusiasm. Think about it. If you're hiring someone, it's your own business. Don't you want someone who wants to be there? 
they, they want to be there so bad that they're bubbling over with excitement and passion, enthusiasm. And they're smiling and they're engaged. That's what we're looking for. Now, people have great BS detectors. And my advice to you is to find an organization, find a career that you're truly passionate about. I do not want you to, to pigeonhole yourself into an area that you are not truly passionate and enthusiastic about. I don't want you to do it. I want you to look for that and let that naturally, that passion come out. I want you to smile and enjoy that interview. Now, I'm going to break this interview process up for you into three areas. The first area being clearly the most important. It's the introduction. The introduction. Dr. Smiley told me this. He says, the decision is made in the introduction. Again, was it buying? He knew it. And he asked me, be honest with yourself, Mark, next time you're interviewing, ask yourself when you're truly making the decision on this candidate. When are you really making the decision on yes or no? And I remember having that conversation, and I'm like, Dr. Smile, I give him the full 40 minutes. That was my response. I give him the full 40 minutes. And he's, he just nodded. He says, I want you to just be honest and ask yourself next time you interview. And I did. And it was scary for me. Because I realized I'm making a decision within the first couple minutes. That's when I was stood back and was just honest with myself. First couple minutes. Matter of fact, what I would do is I would go out from my office, <coughs> go to our lobby and get the candidate, and we'd have some small talk, right, as I'm walking the candidate back to my office. It might be, oh, it's cold out there. It's starting to snow. You know, snow on a bald head is not a good thing. You know, I'm, I'm walking and talking and, and just seeing how they react. Before I got to my office, more often than not, I already knew. I already knew if I wanted them or not. You need to know that. You need to understand how critical and how fast this is being made. This either human connection or a lack of a human connection. I had a number of HR people who reported to me, HR reps. And I shared this information with them. And they did exactly what I did. Oh, no, 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 Mark. I give them the full 40 minutes. Okay. And that's what the doctor's mind said to me. Be honest with yourself. Next few interviews, then come back and talk to me. I want you to know, I want you to come back and tell me when did you make the decision. And they did exactly what I did. They came back and they said, oh my gosh. I knew in the introduction. Over and over. Every one of them. I knew in the introduction. Now, for some reason, when you're in HR, you don't realize it. You really think you're, you're given through this whole interview process. You really think you are. I did. But the harsh reality of it is, you know. You know, and you know very early on. <coughs> this introduction has to be smooth, passionate, enthusiastic, smiling, warm tone. Not the business mark. Don't make that mistake. Don't come in with your stack of papers and facts and figures. I want you to come in and be yourself. Conversational, enthusiastic, great eye contact, warm tone. Now, I'll be, I've interviewed hundreds of UNC students for jobs at State Farm. Hundreds. And I would love to tell you that, oh, oh, UNC students are phenomenal at interviewing. That's not true. Good news for you is the bar is low. <laughs> <laughs> and in, interviewing is a skill. And the more you do it, the more coachable you are, the better you become at it. Now, the, the, generally, the first question you get is, hey, Sally, thank you for coming here. A senior resume, very impressive. UNC, Montford College of Business. I'm excited that you're considering my organization.
organization. Why don't you start off, Sally, by just telling me about yourself. More often than not, I get this. Uh, really? That you're stumped? This is it? You're shocked? And it's not starting off good. Now, I love kayaking. I just do. I, it, it's, you know, everyone has their happy place. Mine is being out and generally I had an open top kayak and really love going out when I get the opportunity to go out on the ocean and just slide my paddle into the water, right? I'm hearing the, the, my hull piercing through the, the waves. It's just serene, relaxing for me. That's my happy place. When this happens, Tell me about yourself, Sally. And I hear this, huh? Oh. I'm kayaking away. Kayaking away in the, in the sense of my mind. I'm already gone. I'm, I'm just doing something else. You'll get all the questions. I'll move on to the next question, but I'm already done. I'm done. It's that fast. It's that fast. So, what does that mean for you? It means you need to be prepared for this introduction. Tell me about yourself. And, and I want this. I'd love to, first of all, thank you for the interview. I'm excited to be here in front of you. I want you to know something about the organization in which you're interviewing. It's amazing to me when I ask them that question. Well, what do you know about us? Why do you want to work here? Well, my parents have state farm insurance. Right? Really? That's why you want to work here? Well, what do you know about our culture? What do you know about promotional opportunities? What do you know about our training? What do you know about our compensation? What do you know about our benefits? Who do you know that works here? What kind of shadow have you done? None of that. None of that. I don't get it very often. Very rarely. And when I get it, we hire them. So I want this introduction from you. And I want you to share information about yourself to allow for this human connection. Please understand that from a human resources perspective, they can't ask you a lot of questions. A large organization is extremely nervous about getting sued. Very nervous. They do not want to get sued through this hiring process. It's very sterile, very scripted. They can't ask you, what's your sexual orientation? Are you pregnant? Are you married? What religion are you? How old are you? I mean, there's, do you have any kids? There's so many questions that are absolutely taboo because they're illegal, rightfully so. They can't ask you those. So as a result, you won't get those kind of questions from them. And some people interpret that like, I can't go, I can't share any information. No, you can share it. In fact, I want you to. I don't want you to, you can go over that, you know, like, I don't want you to go into, well, I had a lance, a, a boil lance the other day, and right, I don't want that. <laughs> but I do want you to just go into who are you? What are your passions? What do you do on your free time? I want to hear that. I want you to create that human connection. If you're married, I want you to just I want you to name your spouse. If you have children, name your children. Tell me their ages. Because guess what happens? Oh my gosh, that's my daughter's name. Did you, what school did they go to? And suddenly you're in this conversation because you were willing to share some information during this. Tell me about yourself. So many people make the mistake of just giving me a summary of their resume. Tell me about yourself. Well, I'm a, a, a 2012 graduate of Montford College of Business. I had a 3.2 grade point average. Uh, I was uh, in this fraternity. <coughs> Now, that's, I already know all that. I already know all that. I asked you, tell me about yourself. That's the question. Don't give me that, uh, uh, like it's a surprise. I want this, yes, thank you. I'd love to tell you about myself. Now, the reality is, this is scripted, because you know it's coming. You should know it's coming. It's scripted. It shouldn't come across canned. Enthusiastic, passionate, great eye contact. So often, the candidate loses eye contact. There's no reason. There's nothing up in the corners you know, to look at. Think about it. You've all been to some social event where you meet someone for a second, 20 seconds. And they say to you, oh, how are you doing? Oh my gosh, that color looks wonderful on you. And I've heard that you were in this fraternity and blah, blah, blah. And suddenly you turn around and you park, you're, 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 you know, you're gone. And you're like, I like that person. 
I like him. Or her. What happened there? What happened? Human connection happened. And generally, it's because they had a warm tone, good eye contact, smiled at you. And it allowed you to create this human connection very quickly. And you left that exchange with this feeling of, I like them. That's the goal of this interview process. That's the goal of this. Now I've had, in Dr. McClatch's class, this was probably two years ago, I'm giving this talk of something similar, and this guy yells out, can I use this to pick up chicks at bars? And I never thought about that before. But yes, you can. It's the same skill. It's the same skill set. That human connection, the ability to, to create that quickly, that first impression, that's I like them. And think about what you do to do that. It is good eye contact. You don't lose it. Is this warm tone? It is that passion, that smile, that excitement. It's the exact same skill set. That's what I want you to deliver during this interview process. That's what Taylor did to get into Princeton on a full ride. He used these techniques. I want you to get rid of the word interview because people pucker up. They just pucker up when you say interview and replace it with conversation. I'm having a conversation with so-and-so today. Fine. And relax. Easier said than done. I get it. But the, if you want the job, I want enthusiasm, passion, warm tone, nice eye contact, wonderful, eloquent script where you're revealing something about yourself, allowing them to create that human connection with yourself. Give them some information that's not on your resume, that truly reveals who you are. Of course, be prepared to answer the question, why us? Why do you want to work here? Be prepared. Don't just go for any company. Go for a company that truly lights your fire. I, I want that. I don't want you to have to BS this enthusiasm and passion. I want it to be real. And I want you to show it to them. Now, 80% nonverbal means you can't say, and I'm really <coughs> excited to be here today. You do something like that, your nonverbals are saying, I'm not excited. It completely discounts what's being said verbally. Completely discounts it. <coughs> Remember that. You've got to show it. You've got to tone your lean, the smile, the eye contact are what is occurring. That's what's being read, 80% of it. It's not just what you're saying, it's how you're saying that to this group, whoever it is. Does that make sense to you guys? It's, I, I, I'll be honest, I, I struggled with it. I did. I didn't buy into it. But I can assure you, Time and time again, I've watched as this works. I still prep a lot of people at State Farm, and they do not like when I say it's about likability. Oh, they, they, just don't, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. And I, I get it because I was there. That's what it's about. Your ability to make this human connection and be likable. So, <coughs> you need to practice this. You will need to either practice in front of a mirror or practice in front of a friend or significant other, but this is something I want you to practice. I want that enthusiasm, passion to just come oozing out of your pores for this next interview that you're going to be going through. Now, a lot of people have this impression that, oh, once I get this interview, I get the job, I'm done. I can play on these skills. No way. It's just not how it happens. You're going to interview 10, 20 times in your career. This is a skill that's going to continue to repeat itself. And your ability to master this interview is going to set the tone of your success. This is something
something I want you to become good at. The introduction, as you can imagine, I've spent a lot of time on it already, is huge. It's huge because I'm convinced the decisions made very, very early on. Very early on in this process. Matter of fact, I'm kind of sad Taylor had to leave because there's uh, a study, they call it the Princeton study. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of studies in Princeton, but this has to do with people's ability to read individuals very fast. Princeton study. And what they did in this Princeton <coughs> study is they would flash up on a computer within just a microsecond two pictures. And they'd ask, what this was was two pictures of state senate candidates across the nation. Now, I don't know what our Colorado state senator looks like, so I'm sure these Princeton students didn't know who these people were. They did tell them that these were uh, uh, political figures that were competing against each other, and they asked one, which one would you vote for? But they only showed the pictures up for a split second, and they had to write down who they would vote for. 75% of the time, the Princeton student picked the candidate who was elected in that microsecond. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy. What was happening was, when you look at the pictures, the candidate who has this nice, warm smile was the one they weren't, went to. That's when they selected. Bam! The microsecond, making, getting visual cues, bam, selecting that person. And that's the person who was elected 75% of the time. It's happening extremely fast. You don't realize it, but you do it every day. You meet someone new, you're processing information very fast. Most of it, just like Dr. Smiley said, non-verbally. Think of the tone. You know, it's interesting. At State Farm, we have a lot of uh, call center-esque jobs for our entry-level positions, call center type. And I talk to them with some frequency, and I ask them, how fast do you know what you have on the other end of the line? How fast do you know? Do you have an angry customer, kind of a joyful customer, a delight to deal with? What do you do? How do you know? And it's interesting that I get, and my average from this is about eight seconds. And all they have to deal with, think about it, is tone, rate, volume. And they're making this impression of what I have on the other end of the line extremely fast. And they're right, probably most of the time. Tone, tonality in this process, you have to deliver it. Smooth tone. I want the, the conversation just like I had with Dr. Smiley when we're having a beer, he's, and I'm just being, being myself, enjoying it. That's where I want you to get in this interview process. Okay, we talked a lot about introduction. I'm going to leave it, but I only want to leave it when I'm confident you understand this introduction is of paramount importance for you to get this position. Absolutely essential. This is the key to the castle, <coughs> is this introduction. Smooth, scripted, great eye contact, warm tone. That's what will allow you to be successful. Now, I want you also to hear from a human resources perspective. What happens? What are we looking for? What are we concerned about? Well, at State Farm, our lowest position, our lowest positions that we have there, absolutely entry level, just simply requires a GED. We spend $80,000 on in that first year. Large organizations, and Gene's probably been working for large organizations and have felt the same thing, <coughs> where large organizations are concerned about getting sued. It's true. So many times they use an interview technique called competency-based interview. Competency-based interview. It is very common. <coughs> I'm, I'm not a huge fan of, I would never go out on a limb and say, this is the best way to interview, to truly understand who you have in front of you. I won't say that, but it is the safest way. And a lot of large organizations utilize it exclusively. 
State Farm being one. Competency-based. The theory behind competency-based is your past performance is the best predictor of what you're going to do in the future. <coughs> past performance, best predictor of the future. For example, you'll get a question of, tell me about a time in which you demonstrated, from your perspective, outstanding customer service. Very common question. Many of the organizations that you'll be competing for have a very strong need to, to deliver great customer service, differentiating you from the competitors out there. Customer service. It's a skill that organizations, including State Farm, look for. The ability to deliver customer service. So the question is, tell me about a time. So it's your past performance. Is my best ability to predict what I can expect from you if I hire you in the future. That's competency based. Seems easy enough. A lot of times, so I get philosophy. And I want you to avoid that. Well, I understand customer service is of incredible importance to this organization because it, it allows us to not only attract new customers, but to retain. No, no, no. No, no, no. That's philosophy. That's not what I'm asking. Tell me about a time in which you delivered outstanding customer service from your perception. From your perspective. Tell me. It's past performance. Based. So it takes a story. So I'm going to tell you how to answer competency-based questions. How do you answer competency-based questions? It, it's very simple. We make it very complicated. We get nervous and we, we do all kinds of things. I want you to keep it simple. It is simple. There's three parts to answer a competency-based question. The first part is the story. Tell the story. The next part is, what did you do? I've heard a lot of different models, and there are a lot of different, like situation, which is the story, action, which is tell me what you did, and result. They call it a SAR model. I just try to keep it as simple as possible. Story, what did you do? What's the result? That's what I want in a competency-based question. Again, many large organizations use competency-based interview techniques, including the Princeton uh, interview. They use the same thing. Large, large uh, school, concerned about being sued. <coughs> Makes sense that they're going to use that. So I'm going to give you an example of it that I hope illustrates how you answer this. Because when, when people hear this, they're like, oh, OK. All right, I get that. So you ask me, Mark, hey, thank you for coming in. Tell me about a time in which you delivered outstanding customer service from your perspective. I would go to say, <coughs> OK, I think I have, I think I have a good uh, answer for you. Well, as you know, I recently graduated from UNC. And while I was going to school at UNC, I worked at Wendy's. And what you may know or may not know is Wendy's is open late. And I was working the night shift, which would allow me to go to school during the day. And this is going back maybe three months ago, before I graduated. And it was, it was nighttime. It was probably close to 1 in the morning. And I'm behind the register. And I have one cook with me. And I had just recently mopped our tile floor. And because it was wet, I put out the yellow, the yellow placards, you know, warning people, uh, warning customers that that floor may be slippery to be cautious. Well, through our lobby windows, I could see the lights of the vehicle pulling up. And I knew we were going to have a customer soon. So I was preparing my, my register uh, in advance of the, of the customer. And sure enough, the front door opens up, and this female walks in. And she takes maybe five steps onto our tile floor and slips. And she fell. And it fell hard. So I rushed out and I assisted her up and I asked her, Are you okay? And she said, Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I think she was more embarrassed than, than, than anything else. So, you know, I said, Well, I'm, I'm sure glad. And as I'm walking back, I'm thinking to myself, You know, here's someone, it's one o'clock in the morning, they patronize uh, Wendy's and they had this terrible experience. So I made the decision that I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to, I'm going to conquer meal that night. 
sure enough, she approaches the register, and I ask her again, ma'am, are you okay? Are you sure? And again, I'm more embarrassed than anything else. She, said, she assured me I'm fine. Uh, so I took her order, and I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry that you had this experience. Please accept the meal tonight on behalf of Wendy's. And uh, she did, and, and she left. And well, the next morning, I, I told my manager, I said, boy, we had this incident, uh, and I made a decision to comp her meal. My management said, you know, that's a, that's a good decision, Mark. I'm pleased you did with it. Well, about a week after that, that same management person called me in, and he asked me, Mark, do you remember, the, you know, the, the, the lady who slipped? And I, was, I said, she, absolutely. I, and I, I was thinking, uh-oh, well, something must have happened. And he said, no, she, she came in, and she asked to speak to my manager. And she told my manager that she was so impressed with my delivery of a caring customer service experience. And that, this is her words, Wendy's has a customer for life. And I must say I felt, I felt really good about that. Okay, done, done with my answer. Now, what did I do? I told you a story. Right? If I did it even halfway right, you saw my girl. You saw what she was wearing. You saw her hair color. I didn't tell you that, but I gave you enough of the information that your mind painted the rest of the picture. What happened to her? She slipped. How do you know? I told you. I gave you that. I, gave you, I didn't have to tell you about the little yellow placard, but I did because it allowed you to get into my story. Then I transitioned, because that's the first one. Story, I told it. What did I do? I helped her up. I asked her, are you okay? I went back to my register. I comped her meal. How do you know? I told you. And finally, <coughs> the last piece of this, what was the result? I got a customer for life. How do you know? Because I told you. Three elements. If you're missing any of those elements, you're going to get questions. You're going to get a question like, well, how did she fall? Right? Didn't tell enough of the story. Or, Mark, what did you do? Didn't get into that. Or, well, whatever happened to her? Results. You get questions like that, you're missing one of these three essential elements on how to answer a competency-based question. You're missing something. Now, generally, if they had a decent introduction, I may throw them a couple bones initially and ask them, well, well, what happened to her? But if they, in the next question, they do the same thing, I'm done. I'm kayaking away. I'll continue to ask the questions, but I'm done. You've got to understand the elements of this way of interview. Story, action, result. That's it. Did I cure cancer? No. Was it super significant? No. I comped a five dollar meal. But did you, were you left with the impression that hey, he gets it, he gets customer service? Yes. Right. Don't think you have to come up with this monster delivery of some super significant event. You don't. No. Now, I generally get the question, oh, Mark, I, there's so many different competencies out there. There's so many competencies. How can I possibly <coughs> prepare for all these? I don't want you to. My advice to you is I want you to come up with your five big hitters. Your five. Five. Every one of these five have a nice story. What did you do? Result. And I also want you to try to look for areas that have different competencies in them. Now, for example, my Wendy's story, completely made up by the way, I've never worked at Wendy's, um, delivers a number of different costs. I could use it for decision making. I could use it for resourcefulness. I could use it for um, initiative, customer service. I could use that same example for a number of different competencies. I have a lot of different competencies. I might highlight part of the story a little bit different depending on it, but the reality is it's the same story. You come up with five of those, you get asked the question, instead of cataloging hundreds, like, oh my gosh, or, uh, I'm an initiative one. Oh, I go, uh, no, I want you to have five in your quiver. You get asked the question, you catalog your five, Pull out that one that meets it perfectly, and you deliver it. And you can deliver it passionately, slowly.
smoothly, has a great story, has a good result to it, and it answers the question. Matter of fact, Taylor responded to Dr. McClatchy and said he used that technique, the five. He had five. And he said, well, I'm just proud of it because it does work. It's just nice to hear one of your peers say it perfectly for his Princeton interview. He had five. They asked him a question. He cataloged his five and pull out that one that meets that competency nicely. That's it. Don't think, don't make it more difficult than you have to. Now, what I'm seeing a trend for is negative questions. Negative questions. You're preparing positive, positive, positive. This is what I did. So I got this, the leadership. I was president of the fraternity. I delivered this in a team project. Well, you're doing positive. And then they ask you, tell me about a time in which you failed to meet a deadline. And you're like, oh, 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 oh failed. It's tough. So same technique with an exception. I want, do want you to think of sometimes where you made a mistake. It's okay. We all do. Except Dr. Clatchy. But we all, other than that, we all do. So, tell me about a time you failed to meet a deadline. I would start it off immediately by saying, well, first of all, I want to let you know that I pride myself on meeting, exceeding, actually, established deadlines. Right? So I cut it off at the knees. They don't think, oh, I got plenty of these. How many do you want? I, no, no. <laughs> right off the bat, bam. And then I'm going to go into my story. I tell them. I'm going to tell them what I did or what I failed to do. And then the result part of the negative is, as a result of that, I learned this. I now use my outlook task or whatever it is. But you learn something from that negative. That's what they're looking for. That's what they're looking for. I don't make it so significant. I don't want you to have this, um, this weakness that's so significant. Because that's another great question. Tell me about your weakness. Like, oh, I'm not really good with dealing with people. Right? It's a sales job. <laughs> that is a fatal flaw. Can't do it. All right. I'm running out of time. So I'm going to wrap that up. We spent a lot of time in the introduction. Rightfully so. I talked quickly how to answer a competency-based question. Very common for large organizations. Now I'm going to transition to what I call the dismount. The dismount is the ending of this interview. This thing's wrapping up. And you know it's wrapping up because you get a question such as, hey, Mark, thank you for coming in. We've asked you a lot of questions. Are there any questions you have from us? Or is there anything you want to leave us with? Right? You, that's your cue that this thing is starting to wrap up. Now, I, I don't want you to ask a stupid question. I just don't. I, I don't like it. In other words, I don't want you to ask a question you could have gotten the answer to reasonably outside of this interview panel. What can I expect to get paid? I'm disappointed right off the bat with that. I, I want you to know that before the interview. Or what kind of training? Get that information somewhere else. I'm not saying don't ask a question, but don't ask a question that you've got reasonably outside of that panel. And then I want you to capitalize on this opportunity. I want you to say, first of all, most often not, I get nothing. I get, you know what, Mark, thank you for your time. I really appreciate your interview today. But, right? I'm disappointed in that. And what I want you to realize is this dismount, and this is going to, I'm going to look for a way to make this stick in your head, because I want you to remember the dismount. Now, we had the Summer Olympics in 2012, uh, and I really do like watching the gymnastics. I just, I don't know why, I just do. I've never been a gymnast or anything, but I do love watching it. And as you know, in gymnastics, they have judges in the Olympics from across the world. Right? So they've got 30 judges watching this athlete. And it, it could be, for example, the uneven bars, for example. And they, the judges are watching, okay, all right, oh, oh, good release skill, check, oh, strength skill. Got it, right? These athletes have to do certain criteria <coughs> during their performance. But it amazes me at a high level of competition, super high, that it comes down to this dismount. You've seen it. 
you know, it's, they, they, get, they swing off the, the bar and they get one of these. And they, oh, oh no, took a step. He took a step. Oh, then you made it. He lost the goal. You're like, really? It was a five minute person with that little teeny step? Yeah. High level competition. It comes down to that dismount. Very identifiable, recognizable. Interviews the same way. You're neck and neck with another candidate. If you miss your dismount, you just say, no, thank you for the opportunity. The other guy's going to get it. I want this. I want, Mark, thank you for the opportunity. Right? I'm using the person's name who's interviewing me. Just like, just like Dr. Smiley used Sarah. Mark, thank you for the opportunity. I really want to work here at State Farming. I'm excited about it. You know, from the, from the homework I've done on it and, and from talking to people that I know who work here in relationship building, I've come to the conclusion that there are a number of skill sets that are absolutely essential for success in this position. From my perspective, it's communication skills, customer service delivery, the ability to make decisions, and the ability to work in a team environment. Those are the skills that are my natural strengths. Those are the skills that I have honed to a fine edge during my time at the Montreux College of Business. Mark, I want to thank you for the opportunity you've afforded me today. And I can assure you, if I'm fortunate enough to be selected, it's a decision that you won't regret. I want something like that. I want something like that. Now, it needs to come from the heart. It needs to be sincere. But did you see, I sold my skills. I, I created this passion about it. I, I let the person know, I understand this job, and I have these skills that mesh nicely with what you're looking for. And if, you're, if I'm fortunate enough to be selected, I loved it. I love it. I want something like that from you. Two areas that are scripted but not canned. Introduction, huge, huge. Dismount. Again, get that dismount in there. Don't just say thanks for the opportunity. I've used every bit of my time today. I want to thank you. You're a very attentive audience. Um, I enjoy doing this because I enjoy having an impact on your lives. If you're coachable and you listen to some of these things, I think you will find this to be very beneficial uh, throughout your career. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for those insightful comments. I know that you may have some questions, and we have a tight uh, schedule here in this room, but you're invited to a reception downstairs in the student lounge, first level. You have some food, you can get a bite to eat, and talk to uh, Mr. Neville about the questions you might have. So I invite you uh, to go down there, and also I want to remind you, if you're getting extra credit, make sure you sign up. Uh, uh, sign your name on the sheets here, and this has been filmed today. So as, as you get closer to graduation and you're ready for some interviews, you can go back to the Montford College of Business website and look up on the right corner, it says Montford Executive Professor Program, and you'll get a drop down, Executive Guest Lectures. Mr. Neville's comments will be there for you to review and prepare your uh, interviews. So. Okay, uh, we'll be down in the, in the lounge in just a couple minutes, uh, so please, uh, if you have time, stop down there, grab some